My name is Chris Hayden. I happen to be the pastor of Kindred UMC, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you to the pre-recorded live show. Coming to you, not live, but pre-recorded from Kindred Studio A, AKA my front room. Hi, I'm Courtney Young. I'm the director of community engagement at Kindred UMC. Hello, I'm Preston, and really invest in popular mechanics. What does that even mean? Like air conditioning. What? What? Invest your time and energy into popular mechanics. Like understanding how to understanding, fix? Yeah, understanding how to fix okay. the AC. Right. Learn a oh, trade. Okay. Where, yeah. Why, do you not learn, know how to do that? Learn a no, trade. No, I like learn a trade. That's what, what? Learn a of trade. course I know. So we are, uh, we are still working our way through the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as it is known, it's, it appears in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. We're looking at the Exodus version. Uh, and uh, we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Just the one verse. It's kind of, that's kind of a record for us, I think. Mm -hmm. So here it goes. Uh, the, these are all the words that Yahweh spoke spake in to Moses. Um, What's and, spake and bacon? Yeah, and they, the, the third commandment goes like this. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of, and it says the Lord your God, it's important to remember in Hebrew that's, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of Yahweh Elohim. For Yahweh will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. That's it. Do you remember the commandments that we've already looked at? One and two. That's right. Nailed it. All right, let's move on. Uh, do you remember the first one? Um, I do, but... <laughs> mm, not off the top Do of you, head. though? Not off the top of my head. The I first don't. one is I am. That's true. Yeah. That's, that is how I'm, it starts. I'm, like, I'm leading you into it. Do you know it? I am the Lord your God, and that's it. Yeah, Yahweh. Uh, I, am, yes. I am Yahweh Elohim. The God who saves. Right. Well, right. The name Yahweh Elohim has like very specific context. So, uh, I'm I'm the big Creator God and the personal present God, the one who rescued you from is from Egyptian slavery, rescued Israel from Egypt, um, and then the but that's not the commandment. That's the setup. The commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. That's right. Well, what's That's the second right. one? The second one is... Oh, uh, love your neighbor as you love nope. yourself. Nope. Oh. That's the Shema. That's very close, though. <laughs> that that's, should be the first one. That's I wasn't close. here for week yeah. two, so... That's very close. How the, old are you? So you're thinking of the Shema. Yeah. So, like, and this it's a weird hierarchy. So, like, at the top, basically, it is... I'll, if you will be my people, I will be your God. Be faithfully obedient to my word. I like the, uh, the more loose translation. I think it gets at the heart of it, which is basically like, be attentive and listen actively for my voice. Mm -hmm. So listen to my voice is what God says. And so that's, the, like, that's the, the first commandment. And then, okay, well, what does it mean to listen to God's voice? Okay, well, then we have the Shema. Break that on. We can put that into two different things. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Shema. So like, listen to my voice. Actively listen and obey my voice. What does that look like? Well, it basically comes down to love God and love your neighbor. Hmm. Okay, well, how do, what does that look like? How do we do that? And the Decalogue kind of gets split in half. And if you'll notice, the first laws that we've looked at in the Ten Commandments are all about loving God. How do you love God? Well, first of all, don't put anything else beside or ahead of God. Hmm. Like, make God the priority. Yahweh Elohim, specifically. The second is idols. Do not try to control this God. Do not make an idol that contains and represents this God, but instead worship this God for who he really, really is. And then now we have this third one, well, uh, which it, a lot of 
more conservative Christians would boil this down to like, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't curse. Don't say the GD word. Don't, you know, uh, like when you stub your toe, don't say Jesus. You know, it, it would turn into that. And um, I don't think that's, that seems very small to make it to the top 10. <laughs> like, yeah. I'll just say it that way. Top three. That seems like not quite enough depth to make it to the top 10. So what the hell is actually going on with taking the Lord's name in vain? So uh, so before we get into the, the meaning of that, let me just clear something up. Because I actually, when I started studying this, the second half of this gets me a little concerned. I will not acquit anyone who uses my name incorrectly. Which sounds kind of the opposite of the God that we've come mm. to understand as gracious and loving and wants to be with his people. Like if you do, but if you'd make this mistake, then you're out. That doesn't add up. There's something else going on here. And so as I did some historical research, it turns out that um, much like we do in our current justice system, like you swear on a Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and so help you God, like that kind of a sentiment. Um, invoking a deity's name in a court of law was like that was kind of a thing, and so there's something going on with that. I will not acquit that it, it, it's an actual uh, judiciary mm. legal reference. It's not just a. It's not about like I won't forgive you. You're out. It's more about the hey, listen, don't use my name to justify your crimes. Like they're like I'm not gonna acquit anyone who like does something wrong and then evokes oh I did it in the name of Yahweh, like right. that's not gonna get you any points with any judge. All right, so that so I that's a little bit of a technicality, but I just that that was something that I got hung up on, and I don't want other people to get hung up on. So let's go back into the names, okay? The name of Yahweh Elohim. Um, so both of you have been through our disciple groups. Um, I, I'll say this as a statement. I'm asking it as a question. It seems to me that most of what we do in our disciple group groups is to get people to actually label their feelings, label their past trauma, to, to put some flesh and bones around it. Mm -hmm. um, it what what has your experience been with that as, as as comfortable as you are to share with you know our 30 something subscribers <clears throat> um i mean i think as someone who frequently self minimizes and often doesn't think about like i actively deflect to think about like Preston's trauma or Matt's trauma or your trauma rather than actually talk through my own because it's easier to talk about how you feel than it is to talk about how i feel so for me like sitting in what I was going through and being able to process like what that one half of my stuff I didn't even associate as trauma until I said it out loud I just thought it was people not liking me let's talk about that for a second okay yeah. sure what what is can you can you be more specific because I can okay so I studied criminology in school, criminal justice. Four years of it kind of teaches you like sociality of people, how people are acting with others and not understanding why they're doing what they're doing for it. Or on the other side, why law enforcement doesn't understand why a criminal is doing. They kind of deem them as criminal and then that's your label. In a criminal stance, most criminality is done. Stealing, burglarizing, um, I won't, I, won't say, I won't say assault and murder, but most assaults Violence, and murder yeah. are done mostly by people close or family members um, to, to achieve a goal. And usually the goal is like a financial or helping a family member out or doing this or that. There's always a justification for it. So where you're saying, I don't see the problem in that, there's always a second side to the story that we can't see for whatever reason. Like we're, we're sh we shield ourselves from it. So. Uh, coping mechanisms, I would yeah, say. Like, like, cause, because to incorporate the other side of it is yeah. like, it's expensive emotionally. Right. Yeah, and learning that in school, like I've always thought a coping mechanism is something that naturally occurs. Something that we pull, put up that we don't necessarily see happening in front of, like a veil is just kind of 
blown in front of us that we have created that we don't recognize until someone else does. So like, to your point, recognizing other people's versus yourself is, is a difficult thing to do on the other. Like you figuring your, your own problems out is the whole reason like your brain works. So you're trying to shield you from you so you don't you know crumble and stay in bed all day helping others to see their things, you're almost sending out like an <clears throat> SOS, like, hey, I might need help too, mm. but I'd like to help your problems first. Also helping other people, for, for the uh, uh, people who kind of operate this way, because not everyone operates this way, but I, uh, we've talked enough, like I think you do. Yeah. Um, helping other people prevents you, like it, it it's it distracts your mm -hmm. mind. I was gonna say, yeah, it's a distraction from my own mm -hmm. yeah. stuff. So, so um, talk a little bit about. I, I, I think you're onto something in the like when you talked about like actually naming and labeling, like your recognizing own. the difference yeah. between what was trauma. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't. I'm not gonna get into specifics with the situation, but. You know, growing up in the church, I encountered a lot of different people and a lot of different leaders. Um, and I was, particularly as a young college, fresh out of high school student, very active and loud and out there and outgoing. Um, and that got shut down a lot. And so I would often find myself trying to help and being told, no, you can't do this. Absolutely not. And I just viewed it as these people didn't like me. Um, but then in actually beginning to talk about very specific interactions of what had been said and how it had been said and how I was feeling in those moments, like <clears throat> I kind of came to realize like, oh no, it's not that people just didn't like you. Like this was gaslighting behavior. And I had never seen it that way because I had never actually like I had repressed so much of it and not talked about any of it because it was hurtful and gaslighting and emotionally manipulative so behavior. I, the, there's something fascinating to me, and I think this, this goes to this particular text. So when you talked about those scenarios in group, as we were kind of working through that, nobody else in the room really was present or witnessed any of that. So we're all, mm -hmm. we're all going off of your description and just kind of listening to you tell your own story. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most that we had to offer was maybe some questions about, well, what, how did that feel? Right. What was that like? The entire process was, I would say like 90 something percent you. Yeah, it was self-discovery. Describing reality that you had already experienced. Mm -hmm. But something about saying it out loud and something about bringing it to the surface and acknowledging it, in other words, maybe naming it, like, and once it was named, that's kind of the end of the process. There's a, a there's a power that you take back. Yeah. I think when you are able to name it. Yeah, because if, if you keep it in your head, you allow yourself to run around. Well, it almost felt yeah, like- Yeah, doing laps yeah. is a, a phrase I use I all the time. I use spiraling a lot, but yeah. it almost yeah. felt like I was able to fully wake up to the things that had happened. I, I don't know if it's that- It's stuff you knew, yeah. but when you said it out loud, all of a sudden you brought it like to, to a yeah. conscious level. It clicked that I had actually lived it. Rather than subconscious. Yeah. Well, especially right. in front of others too, where you're held yeah. accountable. Where yeah, we're having like, witnesses we actually heard you, so yeah. you're kind of on the, on the, on the right. break here. So my point in all of this is to illustrate the power of naming. Hmm. Names have power. And like, so like a, a stupid example is, um, you know, when you pick something up and you look on the, like made in, hmm. it, where is it made? Made in the USA. That brings a certain amount of something to the table. Made in Croatia brings a certain, like there's something going on there. Re, re, like name, reputation, recognition, but also, especially, especially in the ancient world, there's something even deeper going on about when you know the name of something, you can harness the power of that thing. Hmm. And like that's, that's a little bit born out of the, the experience that we just talked about. Right. You know, like there's something about me, uh, you know, I, I had an abusive 
childhood growing up. Um, a lot of times the church had taught me to uh, look at what you've got, like look at the good things, not the bad things. You know, be thank, be grat, grat, uh, express gratitude, be grateful for what you have, not grieving what you should have had that you didn't. Um, and a lot of power in my life came from just like naming, no, 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 I was abused, this is abuse, this is wrong. Um, my parents were supposed to do better. And it's, that's not my fault, that's their fault. And there was a, a tremendous amount of power in naming those types of things mm -hmm. that, that kind of like set me free in a lot of ways to like start to actually be who I was supposed to be and who, who I really am and how I feel inside. There's a similar thing going on in the belief of the name of Yahweh. And I don't think it's as mystical and magical as it sounds. Um, and the examples that I would like to use are examples where how many times in the name of Christ has someone uh, sown division, mm. bigotry, and hatred? Oh, oh, oh. Throughout oof. the Bible. Big oof. Yeah. Yeah. Do not use my name for vanity's sake. Mm. Like, my name has power. It will not acquit you from judgment for how you use it. Mm. Like, that's the way that this commandment actually reads. Do not use my name for vanity's sake. So if you, uh, if you will please pardon the expression, but it's the actual name, God hates fags. Yeah. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Like, God. Like, and, and I need this text for that. Hmm. Do not use my name for vain purposes. To have others it, follow. It will not acquit you. Right. From judgment for hatred and bigotry. You, like... Using my name will not acquit you from the heinous actions that you are committing. Like, and uh, like it, it's, it, it gets boiled down into like, you shouldn't cuss. Yeah, I was gonna say, I had never heard of it, never even thought about it this way my whole life. I mean, it was it's, always... where, it's where cursing comes from. Like, hey, everyone, you're on my team and we don't like that team. I'm going to say God likes us and not them. I've brought this up before. There's a few movies or whatever scenarios where this side is the God side and the other side can't be the God side because we have to win. Right. Meanwhile, the leader on the other side is like, we also have God on our side. Why don't we even know what they're talking about? And then they converge and everyone dies. <laughs> right. And then they beat yeah. each other with axes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> the point is using like a, the name as like a scapegoat or like, mm -hmm. a, yes. cheap, like a cheap date. Like, yeah. hey. And certain, certainly historically that's happened, yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, uh, the main thing I want to get at is like, no, that happens, that's, that is actively happening now. Yeah. Right. And like, so one example is in the United Methodist Church, uh, we are partly because of COVID, COVID has prolonged this experience, but we have been debating LGBTQ inclusion for, I don't know, over a decade. Like it's it's been a, an active political debate, and I won't bore you with the political structures of the United Methodist Church, but um, it, the, our last general conference that we had in person, our bishop made this really profound state, that, and it it has stuck with me, and I really believe it, even though it seems uh, difficult to come by these days. And he was, he was essentially uh, lifting up the two sides that were against each other, you know? The people who were like, I think scripture says this about gender and sexuality, and I do not want my church to condone, you know, the opposite. And people on the opposite side. Um, my actual real life experience with LGBTQ plus people, this is a real thing. It's an actual natural expression of uh, like God's creation. Um, excluding people based on this is a sin and is uh, wrong. Like, so like you can hear both arguments 
And the, the bishop, our bishop, made this point uh, at this general conference. Um, and and this, it was even in a less politically divided climate than we are in today, because it's only gotten worse. But his whole thing was, essentially, if there is any hope left in the world for people's ability to disagree on the, the, the minutia and still relate to each other in love and graciousness, then it must come from the church. Mm. This is our legacy. This, if, if we can claim one thing in the world, it ought to be the ability to love the people who are opposite from us. Who we, eat, though they are opposed to us, we see them as actual children of our, our creator and love them with grace and mercy the same way that we have been loved by grace and mercy ourselves. Like, if there is any hope in the world that the divided can be reconciled and actually love each other and live in communion with one another, then it ought to come from the church. Right. And we have so spectacularly failed. A lot of work. To we, do. we are not victims. We are not the oppressed. We are not these people who have been cast aside. We ought to be the leaders in love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation. We are not victims. Like we, we worship a crucified and risen God. If we're victims, then we believe that that only makes us stronger. Like then, then yeah, we. I'm at my dude. I'm a Christian. I'm at my best when I'm being oppressed and victimized. Man, that like that's my whole bag, man. Like that's where we win. Like so, like if that's the truth then we are called to lead the way in reconciliation and grace and forgiveness. And, and we have just completely failed at it. Just completely failed at it. So as best I can tell, this text is a call to any who would even like remotely claim a relationship with the divine, any people, who have any spiritual sense at all, who believe that there's something more going on here and want to cooperate with it, if that even remotely connects with you, then this is a calling for all of us to lead the way in extending a hand, ex expressing grace, trying to listen, uh, getting over our differences, and claiming siblinghood, claiming hum human communion, with people who are whatever version of other you might be tempted to consider. So, a <laughs> little bit, little bit preachy, but I, I feel like, I feel like, uh, I feel like there was something. A little I, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.